Hello, I'm Rob Califf and I want to welcome you to this next in our series of interviews with important people in cardiovascular medicine. As you know, this has been a lot of fun for me to talk with people who I interact with who I think have had a big influence on the field of medicine and specifically heart disease. The purpose of these interviews is to give you some insight into what they're thinking, why they do what they do, and hopefully to inspire others to become leaders because we sure are in a time where we need leaders today. So I'm particularly pleased today to have with me Dr. Ray Gibbons. Ray was around Duke University when I, as a third year medical student, decided to do a year of research in clinical research in cardiology. Ray was a cardiology fellow at the time and really was an inspirational figure for me to think about applying rational thought and statistics to medical practice. He went on to do a number of great things, including being the president of the American Heart Association, and he's now very involved with the Mayo Clinic in trying to help with health care reform, something that we'll get to at the end of the interview. So, Ray, welcome. Thanks, Rob. Good to be here. So, Ray, tell me about your uh, early life. Uh, you look like you're sort of a Scandinavian kind of a guy. Where did you grow up? Well, Rob, I grew up just outside New York City, a small blue collar suburb named Woodridge, New Jersey. 8,000 people, um, really um, primarily composed of manual workers, blue collar workers. My father commuted into New York. Um, it was a very diverse community, um, primarily at that point Polish Americans, Italian Americans, Hispanics. Um, and interesting to sort of point out that in my high school class, 20% went to college. Uh, wow. Most of those went to state teachers colleges in New Jersey. I was only the second student in the history of the school to go to an Ivy League university and the first one to go to Princeton. It was not a um, s sort of silver spoon childhood. I would point out that in my sophomore high school English class, the girl who sat across from me was arrested in an FBI raid for narcotics because she was a heroin addict. Well, that's an interesting way to start a high school career and uh, the, in the way things go. What about the rest of your family? You have brothers and sisters? I have one older sister. Yes, she's five years older than I am and currently resides in the great state of North Carolina. All right. My favorite state at this point. And then um, your mom, what about your mom? What, your dad uh, was working in New York and commuting. What about your mom? My mom was a homemaker, basically. She, uh, she basically didn't work outside the home and uh, took care of us and took care of the household. We've been sort of laughing because um, when I interviewed Peter Slide, he noted that his mom uh, stayed at home and he made a comment about she did nothing, she stayed at home, which um, I, that's not really what he meant, but my mother actually watched the interview and logged in and made a comment uh, chiding Dr. Slide for his, um, his uh, statement. And uh, we know what he meant, but I, I'm sure uh, having someone at home for you was an important part of growing up. It was a very important part of growing up. My father, like most commuters, spent a lot of time getting to and from work, actually. Um, something when I tried to do it one summer, I was amazed at how hard it was. So what kind of things did, were you interested in as a, as a kid? I, you know, I sort of had imagined maybe you were a nerdy mathematics kind of a person. But. I was. <laughs> I, um, I was very interested in school. I was very interested in mathematics. I skipped a grade in elementary school. Um, and um, that was a, a major interest as well as sports. I was uh, very interested in sports, uh, particularly uh, baseball and football. Sounds like sort of an all-American, despite the fact your school was not um, upper class. In a sense, maybe that really is sort of all-American. You grew up in a, in a bedroom community and uh, with a lot of working class people, played baseball and football and, and worked on math. It sounds, sounds really good. Was there anybody, any of the teachers in your high school that made a big uh, yeah, impression? Actually. Yeah, one teacher in particular who encouraged me to sort of think broader beyond the community, who involved me in um, YMCA youth and government programs within the um, context of high school. And uh, he was a great positive influence on my life. Um, and through the involvement in that activity, 
I actually got to see communities outside of where I live um, and appreciated the fact that educate, public education in the immediate vicinity in other communities was a whole lot better than where I was. Um, and at his encouragement, I went off one summer um, to a program that the National Science Foundation used to sponsor for high ability secondary school students. I went up to Clarkson in upstate New York and spent a summer there studying science and math. Um, and that was uh, an enormous eye opener to me. Yeah, I bet that was a little different than your uh, football teammates were uh, mostly thinking about. Yes, <laughs> very, very much different. So with, with that inspiration, you, you went on to uh, Princeton. I went on to Princeton courtesy of uh, scholarship money from Princeton and from the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. I am a product, I like to think, of U.S. educational opportunity. Well, that's fantastic. And what, what kinds of uh, people did you uh, befriend there? What, what sort of influence did that have on you? I was, in, uh, I was an engineering major. Uh, I chose to do that not because I was going to necessarily spend my life doing engineering, but because I was good at science and math and thought it would teach me um, how to think. And I was in a special honors program, so I was really an engineering physics major. Um, and uh, that shaped my future to a great degree. Um, I was into science in a serious way and managed by just good fortune to have a very, very unusual undergraduate advisor. His name was Seymour Bogdanov. He was a member of the National Academy of Sciences, was a premier aerospace scientist who most people found um, very intimidating. He did not tolerate any um, shabby thinking <laughs> in any of the people around him and uh, taught one of the most difficult courses in the engineering school. Um, so was known as a tyrant. He was my advisor. He was a wonderful guy who had a very broad view of the world, who encouraged me throughout my undergraduate career. That, that's fascinating. Of course, I, as you know, I have two sons who are engineers. One uh, went all the way through the aerospace deal. The other is a mechanical engineer, but they're both working in the aerospace in, in industry. So, Well, a, they'll understand that <laughs> my undergraduate independent study was on hypersonic flow over the leading edge of a flat plate. There you go. I've heard some conversations <laughs> they've had about things like that. I understand none of it. But there is a certain uh, rigor of thinking that comes about when you have to solve. It's really all about problem solving in yes. engineering, isn't it? Yes. In, in the, I was trained in a rigorous scientific approach. So one of the things I've noticed about engineers typically, though, is that they are very focused on um, solving physical problems, but often very uncomfortable with broader issues. And you know, there's a classical, Dilbert is really all about this, if you read the comic strip about the engineers who are trying to accomplish things, and then the rest of the world is impeding their ability to get things done. What, what is it about you, do you think, that you have maintained, it sounds like you started in high school sort of trying to live in both worlds. Maybe I could ask it a different way. Do you pay a price in terms of your peace of mind because you're trying to live in both worlds? Um, there's a tension. There's a tension between the rigor and the reality of, um, of life for, uh, for most people and um, specifically around public issues. So for example, when I was an undergraduate, um, I volunteered in the city of Trenton um, doing tutoring of minority students um, in the elementary and junior high level in science and mathematics. Uh, so I could quickly see that tension in terms of the world I was living in at an Ivy League university and the reality for them. I did that because I felt fortunate to be at Princeton. Um, and when I realized midway through my freshman year that I was the top ranking student in my class at Princeton um, and that it was opening educational opportunities that I had never possibly imagined growing up where I did, 
I sort of felt at that point that I needed to do something to make that opportunity a reality for other people. So I think I've got a good sense of, uh, of what you were thinking at that time, but you come to an end of a college career, especially with a scientific mentor and discipline, and you have to go do something else. What, what happened? Well, that's, that's a good story in and of itself. Uh, I would remind you that um, I was uh, in undergraduate school during the Vietnam War um, and the period of great uh, crisis in the country and a period of great concern about the role of technology and engineering. And at that point, a great crisis in aerospace science uh, with respect to the spending going on in the space program. So as I came to the end of my undergraduate career, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I actually began to interview with law schools, business schools, and graduate school. <laughs> and that was partly on the advice of my advisor, who realized that I didn't really know what I was going to do next. On the advice of a good friend, I um, applied for the Rhodes Scholarship that year. And that answered my question, because I got it, was fortunate enough to be named a Rhodes Scholar. So off I went to Oxford. And I, as some people know, I just interviewed Peter Slight, who, um, of course, is an Oxford man, and he told the story of Salim Yusuf arriving as a Rhodes Scholar. And I had a chance just a few weeks ago to take a tour of Oxford, guided by Salim. And it, that, that's a very uh, personal, the Oxford, the, the Rhodes Scholarship seems to be a very personal thing for people because it gets pretty intense when you're there. It's very intense. Uh, during that era, though, for most of us, it was a step away from all the turmoil in the country um, and an opportunity to re-examine what we each wanted to do. In my case, I actually thought about doing pre-med um, courses right off the bat in Oxford, but I decided against that. I didn't want to turn away from hard science just yet, so I actually did a master's degree in mathematics. Uh, doing pretty much the same engi engineering physics work I'd done, but it was in the math department. It was an earned degree, not an honorary master's from Oxford. And my um, master's thesis was on approximate solutions to nonlinear differential equations. There you go. Something most of us think about every morning when we wake up and are drinking a cup of, <laughs> cup of coffee. And uh, by the way, those solutions haven't yet been, <laughs> been achieved. Uh, it, they underlie the whole problem with fusion uh, as a source for energy production. But in any case, uh, I decided in the course of that year that I didn't want to do this the rest of my life to the chagrin of my uh, thesis advisor who pointed out I could get an Oxford D. Phil in another two years. Um, I chose not to do that. I knew I'd do something in biologic sciences, so thanks to the flexibility of the road system, I actually then did courses in organic chemistry and biology with Oxford undergraduates. Oh, that must have been a lot of fun. Yeah. And so you, got, you, you did that, and it, I'm sure it came away with an even broader view of the world, but you had to go somewhere to get a medical degree. I wasn't yet ready to make that big jump. I still thought I was going to use my engineering. So I actually came back to the United States and interviewed in biomedical engineering programs. But in the back of my mind was the fact that I thought I might end up needing to get a medical degree. Uh, so that was one of the questions I asked as I went around. Um, and I had a choice between the Harvard-MIT program uh, or Johns Hopkins. And because the route or potential route to a possible MD degree seemed clear at Johns Hopkins, that's where I went. And I spent a year as a graduate student in biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins where I was fortunate enough to spend some time with one of the premier biomedical scientists of that era, Kichi Sagawa. Um, not a lot of time, but enough to make a difference. Kichi was a wonderful you learn? guy. What did you learn from that? Kichi was committed to applying the same kind of rigor I was used to, to biologic questions. And um, he felt that the two were compatible. Um, and I found that very attractive and very inspiring. Um, because at the same time I was volunteering on the weekends in the Johns Hopkins emergency room, which is basically a combat zone, uh, so I could see the reality of what went on 
day to day in terms of medical care, particularly in the inner city, um, and was looking for some balance between those two notions. It was actually the volunteer work that convinced me that I enjoyed taking care of people. So you um, like being a doctor? Yeah. So I better go to medical school. How old were you by this time? <laughs> well, remember, I skipped a grade in elementary school, so that helped. I graduated from undergraduate school at age 20. So by, by, uh, by that point, uh, I was 23. Okay, so still a youngster. And you, still a youngster. Where'd you go to medical school? Well, uh, I thought Hopkins was going to provide an easier path. It turned out there were all sorts of internal politics to that and quite a lot of delays. So I then recontacted the Harvard MIT program, which I had turned down the year before, and they took me back at a second year level, given the year I'd done as a graduate student. So I went to the Harvard MIT program in health sciences and technology. I also applied to the regular Harvard Medical School program, and I tell this story to trainees because I, I think they might find it interesting. When I applied to medical school, I said I wanted to be a clinical investigator in cardiovascular diseases is in a major academic center. And the Harvard admissions representative who interviewed me was a psychiatrist who told me that was a ridiculous idea and I was never <laughs> going to be able to do that. So I should just refocus and, and realign myself. Um, I haven't ever f followed up to see what became of him, but I know be <laughs> what became of me. And I ended up doing exactly what I said I would do. But, but nothing you had done uh, really had pointed to clinical investigation. I just found when I was, I, I already had the sense from what I had seen at Hopkins and from my involvement, as I say, pretty limited with Kichi Sagawa and some of the other folks at Hopkins, that that's where I could make a contribution. And part of it was to try to bring the same rigor from my engineering background to issues in clinical medicine. All right, so then you had the Harvard Medical School, which uh, m many people have, you know, know a good bit about that, but what, was there anything different about your Harvard experience, you think, than the many other leaders that have come from that um, school? My, my experience was different probably because I came in as a transfer student, which was highly unusual. I joined the second year of the Harvard MIT program. So a whole lot of things had to be gerrymandered to fit for me. Um, and so I, uh, the dean never quite figured out, believe it or not, even after I'd been there for three years, what year I was in, um, that the, the bureaucracy had a hard time with that. But for example, when it came time to arranging my examination of the patient course, physical exam, I was out of sync with the rest of the system. So the then program director, Irving London, had to line something up. And it's interesting that the person he sought help to do that was Gene Brownwald, oh. who identified in a cardiology fellow who was my mentor for physical exam and taught me physical exam. And, and uh, I laugh about it now, but it's actually you know, pretty ironic that when the fellow was unavailable, the person who filled in was Richard Gorlin. Wow. So Brownwall and Gorlin, uh, that, you, you, you've met some uh, interesting people. In right. I'm you know, just part of the good fortune of opportunity. And last night here at the meeting, um, Peter Yurchak got a posthumous award uh, from Council of Clinical Cardiology as the Lenech Master Clinician. I was fortunate enough that my first attending on a clinical rotation in Harvard Medical School was Peter Yurchak in medicine. Uh, just a wonderful guy who taught me um, how to present cases, how to analyze cases, um, and uh, was a very big force in my life as a medical student. So then you, you got through Harvard and somehow you ended up at Duke, which is where I met you. What? Well, I, I, went, I was a Harvard medical student. I stayed at the MGH um, where um, Peter Yurchak was again one of my attendings. And uh, as I thought about what I was going to do, where I was going to go in cardiology, I sought Peter's advice. And uh, Peter said, well, you know, you've got to focus, Ray. That's gonna, you're, you're good clinically, you've got this knowledge base, but you've got to decide 
you know, where your focus is going to be. And I have an idea for you. There's this young guy here who's doing this work in radioisotopes that I don't really understand, but I think you, go, you should go talk to him. That young guy was George Beller, who was an advanced fellow at the time. And I got a literature list from George Beller about the early work on thallium, went off and read that, decided I'd be interested in nuclear cardiology for sure. And so then I looked at the landscape of who was working in nuclear cardiology, and that's how I ended up at Duke as a cardiac fellow. So we, we uh, shared some uh, good times at Duke, and um, we just uh, had the 40th anniversary of the cardiovascular data bank last week and showed some films of Dr. Stead and so forth. In, any uh, distinct memories? Because Duke was sort of your next to last stop, wasn't it? And then you <laughs> went to Mayo Clinic, and that's the rest of your life. Well, I had some very good um, memories of that time. Um, and there were a whole bunch of people who I see as mentors from that era. The Nuclear Cardiology Unit was a joint effort. Um, so Bob Jones, Fred Cobb, um, and Ed Coleman all contributed to the leadership of that effort from cardiovascular surgery, cardiology, and nuclear medicine. I learned something from all of them. Uh, I did work with the data bank as a fellow and particularly learned from uh, the statistical folks at the data bank. Kerry Lee read, did a course on statistics for the cardiac fellows that I attended. I worked with Kerry on several clinical research projects, so he was a mentor. And then um, there was a physicist who worked in nuclear medicine, Craig Harris, who did our basic physics training for certification in nuclear cardiology. Remarkable, remarkable guy, well known nationally, only ever actually in terms of formal education got a master's degree, very, very knowledgeable. Um, so he taught me techni the technical aspects of nuclear cardiology very, very well. So all of those people played a role. Uh, Craig Harris, by the way, we didn't re actually realize what a remarkable human being it, he was until we took him out to dinner at the end of this course and discovered that he lied about his age during World War II to get into the service. So he flew combat missions in a B-17 over Germany at age 18. Wow. <laughs> that, that, that took courage. And so uh, you, I, I know you were well-trained uh, um, at, at Duke and you were ready to go out into the world. How, how'd you pick Mayo Clinic of all places? That's a, I, I had actually not realized you had never been in the Midwest as a place to be. Well, I actually found that the, mark, the, the marketable skill that I had at that point, again, reflecting the way things evolve in, in the technical aspects of medicine, was my training in nuclear cardiology. So places weren't interested in the fact that I was a trained angiographer or that I was a well-trained clinician from a major place, they were more interested in this new area of nuclear cardiology. So I had a number of um, contacts about that. The Mayo story is unique uh, just in terms of personal contacts. It came about because one of the Australian um, Rhodes Scholars at Oxford, who I knew at Duke, um, Phil Harris, introduced me at a national meeting to a friend of his, Bernard Gersh, who happened to have just started on the staff at the Mayo Clinic, who told me I should look at the Mayo Clinic. I'm and, learning a lot and, here in this discussion. And that was, actually the, that was actually how I came to write to the Mayo Clinic and express some interest, and then I got contacted by Bob Fry, the chief of cardiology, and one thing led to another. Duke wasn't too happy when I chose to not stay at Duke, but go to Mayo. Well, but I saw Mayo as those a, kinds of things. <laughs> some do and some don't. Uh, uh, I saw Mayo as a, a great opportunity building from the ground up. Uh, and I was very impressed um, when I went there to realize that they had people in their late 50s and 60s who were still very into, involved in research and very academically active. They were doing it their entire careers and I found that very appealing. So it's gonna be hard, but in the interest of time, we're gonna to have to sort of fast forward through the Mayo, but right. there must be so many. You, you've been there how many years? 28. 28 years. Who, who are the people that stand out as having influenced you and, and, and why? 
there's no question that the major influence for me at Mayo has been Bob Fry, as for many people at Mayo. He, um, he was a mentor in many of the early days um, when I was first starting up. He was supportive at a whole variety of uh, difficult uh, um, junctures of that career. So he's been, he's been a mainstay. And as I followed your career, as of course I did, you've had an illustrious research career, but maybe the thing to focus on is your uh, leadership in the American Heart Association and then now subsequently your involvement in the politics of medicine at uh, multiple levels. What should young people know about the American Heart Association and why should they be involved? Um, I got involved in the Heart Association at an early stage and one of the things that struck me was that it was a values-driven organization and it values, its values matched mine. And that was very appealing from the word go. Um, particularly for me, scientific rigor and scientific excellence were core values of who I was. And trying to bring those to medicine, to evidence-based medicine, was a driver. And the Heart Association clearly believed in the rigor of its science. Growing up where I did, and I didn't go into more details, I believed in the diversity of this country as a strength. And the Heart Association shared that value. And that was very appealing to me from the earliest days of involvement. So people ought to realize that it's a much broader thing than a professional organization. It's actually not a professional organization. It's a public health organization with the highest principles that depends on broad support from many, many citizens who donate small amounts of money every year to keep the Heart Association going in its various activities. So I believe in its values. I think it's a broad tent to attract people from a whole range of professional areas, but also lay people who participate as volunteers in a variety of ways. And um, it has been uh, a great opportunity for me to try to participate in the mission of the Heart Association. Well, Ray, I'd like to um, switch gears here to the current politics and um, the way these segments come out, people can click on different segments, and I think a number of people may want to click on this next segment. But before we do that, just a word about your family. Obviously, you got married, had children, all those things. Can you, can you give us a little insight into how you balanced all this? I hope successfully. I think we all struggle with that, as you know, because I worked very long hours. Um, my wife is a physician. She is a Cambridge and Oxford educated physician who uh, decided, she made the decision that once she, we started having a family, she would take care of the family and wouldn't work outside the home. So um, my kids benefited from that. She, she carried the load because of my working hours. We have three great kids. Um, they're products of Minnesota and we're proud of it. Um, so I have an adult son in, in Colorado who uh, was working in energy consulting and is now self-employed in the sort of computer software business. Uh, another son who's an environmental lawyer uh, in um, a major firm in, in St. Paul, in, Minis in Minneapolis and lives in St. Paul. He's married. Uh, and then I have a daughter who's a senior at Case Western Reserve and is the only one of my three children to express interest in medicine, she's going through the medical school application oh, process wow. right must now. Must be exciting. And how many grandkids? Uh, none at this point. None yet. None was... yet. Well, um, so you've had a, I mean, it's an, to me, you, uh, people are always interesting. And so here you are, a rigorous scientist, uh, having been imbued with the values of Mayo Clinic, which we all um, admire as a great healthcare institution with many great figures and now having experience in leadership and with a supportive family. What on earth possesses you to want to deal with a, such an um, organization as the U.S. Congress? I think it's a, it's a necessity. Um, I worked for many years on practice guidelines for the ACC and AHA. I saw 
the fact that they weren't being implemented nearly as uniformly as, as we all thought they should. I saw that there were major health systems issues. There were obstacles to that in terms of their implementation. And I began to realize that the system was the problem, not the docs, was the system. So I got interested in healthcare policy again, because again, I had been interested in high school. Um, I returned to my roots from that standpoint. And as a AHA president, that was on my agenda. So I devoted my presidential address to the need for health care reform. And that was in 2006, three years ago. And now I've evolved to being part of Mayo's effort on, in the Capitol uh, on health care reform. We're in a unique position being one of the few health care providers who is actually very much involved in the process. So just one quick comment about that. You, you know, one nice thing about being HA president to a lot of people, I think, is you sort of, you, you have your succession plan, you do, you have your year in the spotlight. I know you're working hard before and even for a few years after, but fundamentally, um, you finish your time and you're not responsible for all the things that happen afterwards. It seems like in this case, you've thrown yourself into something um, which, depending on how it comes out, is going to have a major impact, and for which Mayo, because of its uh, position, um, will be a target. Absolutely. Absolutely. On the other hand, I think healthcare providers need to be represented in the process. Everybody else who has a vested interest in this 16 or 17 percent of the U.S. economy is there. And it's incredibly important, I believe. When you sit, I sat at the third hearing of the Senate Finance Committee, which was supposed to be about economics and morphed into a the discussion about health care delivery. There were 15 PhD economists and a bunch of senators who have no idea what's involved in health care. And they were talking about health care delivery until fortunately, one of the economists said, you know, I don't think we're really qualified to talk about this. <laughs> Well, many of us have gotten pretty frustrated with what's uh, happening, and I'm not sure the doctors all together, which I want to um, get to in just a minute. Um, but what do you think is going to happen now? It seems like to me that we've lost uh, the chance for meaningful reform of the payment system, which I would have thought was the most critical thing. Of course, we need more access, and it sounds like that'll happen. But There have always been two issues. One has been insurance reform and covering the uninsured. The other has been to modify the payment system because it distorts everything we do. Um, the f despite all the turmoil in Congress, the first issue is actually easier, the insurance reform that they're still struggling with. Um, the second one is far harder because the current system simply isn't sustainable. Everybody is going to have to give something up. So the moment you talk about changing it, people who have interests figure out they might lose something. And so they oppose that change. And the politicians are very reluctant to tell the U.S. public or any of these interests that they're going to have to give something up. So what's your prediction? I think there'll be a bill. I think it'll be heavy on insurance reform and coverage and light, unfortunately, on payment reform. Do you see a way in the future that this will be faced up to? The House bill has provisions that would direct the, in, the Institute of Medicine to face up to it. The Senate Finance bill had provisions for HHS, presumably the head of Medicare, to face up to it. I have to admit that at this point, watching the Washington politics, I am actually pessimistic that they'll be able to face up to the enormous forces arrayed against them trying to preserve the status quo. So in the, in the next to last thing I want to talk about um, in this regard, um, I'd like you to address the issue of the physicians, because after all, we can only do so much. And I'm not sure the physicians are all together on this, because many of them do see um, the opportunity to lose. Um, cardiologists in particular have done quite well with the current payment system, which rewards doing study after study, I might add, often in the field that you helped develop, right. which has been one of the biggest sources of profit for cardiology practices. So what's your view of whether uh, physicians are really behind payment reform? I think 
that they all pay it lip service until, uh, at least in some cases, they figure out that they may lose something in, in this with this change. And then they look to divert it to somebody else. Um, I think that's a, an unfortunate thing. I think we've all been trapped over time in the system that rewards tests and procedures. And given the declining Medicare reimbursement, everybody's tried to make it up on volume and grow the business. The business mentality has now dominated medicine. I believe we've lost our way. We're not doing the basics well. We're not taking care of high blood pressure. We're not making sure that people with coronary disease are actually taking aspirin chronically forever. Uh, those basics are being overlooked. The patient is being overlooked. We're not talking to patients the way we should so that they understand their illness and what their options are. And unfortunately, that's driven by a very bad system. I think it's very difficult for people to look beyond their self-interest to what is best for the country. And until they do, we're going to continue to have this tendency to say, yes, the system's got to change, but change it for somebody else. Don't change it for me. The reason I'm passionate about this is I believe that this is no longer about health care reform. I think it's about fundamental values in the United States. I think it's about educational opportunity from which I as an individual benefited. Educational opportunity is rapidly disappearing even in the state of Minnesota because of health care costs. We must change the system. I agree with the president that it's a long-term economics issue. Whether people will get past their self-interest, I don't know. Well, my last question then is what about Ray Givens in the next decade? What, what do you plan to do? Is this the issue you're going to be focused on, you think, for the rest of your career? Because it does sound like a long-term issue. Or do you have other plans? Well, you know, I. I, I operated in life on a series of three to five year plans. Um, you may recall that there were several people at Duke who did that in an earlier era. Um, so I worked on practice guidelines, then I worked on the ACC or AHA and ACC leadership uh, sort of issues. Um, I don't have that kind of sense of Ray Gibbons at this point. I'm certainly uh, actively involved in the public policy realm. Uh, but depending on what goes on with that, I don't know how long that will last. Um, and we'll have to see. For the moment, I'm trying to bring some rigor to some of the other things that people have put forward, such as appropriateness criteria, in terms of making sure that they meet the kinds of standards we should be talking about if they're going to be used to drive health care reform. I think we need to be cautious about doing things that aren't really going to hold up to scrutiny or don't reflect the evidence. Great. Well, I want to thank all of you all for joining in this really interesting conversation to me. And I think the last few statements by Dr. Givens are extraordinarily meaningful. We should all pay attention to this because in the short term, we may come out better one way or the other. In the long term, it really is about fundamental values. And the story of scientific rigor, uh, interest in public policy. Um, it's a fascinating mix of things. And Ray, I hope you do stay really active the next decade. I think we're going to need you. Thanks, Rob.